Variable fonts in After Effects have been around for a while. They look like regular fonts with different weights and styles. Nothing wild at first glance. The real magic only showed up if you installed an extra script, because After Effects didn't support it natively. With that script, you could animate seamless morphs between the styles. Super cool! But the options were pretty limited. So yeah, I really never felt tempted to use variable fonts in my projects. Until now. Hey, I'm Michael. Recently, the After Effects team has been pushing updates at high speed. Just a few days ago, I talked about the new parametric 3D features. And now, according to Adobe's update notes, you can animate weight, width, slant, and more directly in the timeline using text animators. That means you can combine them with all the existing text animator features, even Wiggle. Their examples already showed what's possible. But when I tried it myself, I wanted to make it even cooler, like... Hey, what's up? Michael Punch. No, that's not really my wording. For this tutorial, I'm using the variable font Gamai. You can recognize such a font when the variable font axis button appears in the properties panel. Clicking on it reveals the axis, basically the adjustable properties of the font, in this case, weight and width. You'll notice that different font styles are essentially the same font, just with different access values. As a Creative Cloud subscriber, you get access to a bunch of these in your Adobe Fonts library. You can filter them by clicking Variable Fonts. When you select one, you can see its axis and preview how it behaves when you adjust the values. Now let's animate the text. The comp is 1920 by 1080 pixels, font size 380. And by choosing the style white black, we define the final state of the animation. A new feature, you can now add text animators directly from the properties panel. Click add animator, then add weight and width. Lower both values to 100, which corresponds to the narrow thin style. That sets our starting state. In the range selector, open the advanced section. Here, you can choose animation graph shapes, for example, square, which makes each character start morphing only after the previous one is done, or ramp up, where the morphs overlap smoothly. Let's stick with ramp up. Set offset to minus 100%, create a keyframe at frame 0, then another one at frame 100, with offset set to 100%. Looks nice so far, but we want each character to stay in place. Go to More Options and set Variable Font Spacing to Default. Perfect. Now let's tweak the easing. Ease High 50% and Ease Low 50% feels smooth, so we'll keep it. To get the look I'm looking for, set the Width Axis back to 200. This keeps the text wide while only the weight animates. Duplicate the text layer, move it forward to frame 15 and drag the left edge back to frame 0. Set the duplicated layer as an inverted alpha track mat. Nice! Looks like a flat 3D extrusion. But now I feel that the easing doesn't quite fit. I found these values work best. Track mat layer, ease high 50%, ease low 0%. Main text layer, ease high 0%, ease low 50%. Feel free to experiment. When we zoom in, you'll see the text doesn't fully disappear. There is a small outline left. With the mat layer selected, enable stroke and set it to 1 or 2 pixels to expand the shape slightly. Now pre-compose this and apply CC Vector Blur to the pre-comp. Normally, it uses a vector map to drive the blur direction, but even without one, you can create some interesting looks. My favorite type is Direction Fading, which creates a glassy look with additional shine rays. CC Vector Blur is one of my favorite effects. I already used it in my Daft Punk logo reveal tutorial. Since we don't need the shine rays here, apply Set Matte to keep everything inside the text shape. Tweak the vector blur until you like it. For example, amount to 174, revolutions to 0.7. You can always change these later. So far so good. I want a more distinct line on the left though. Go back into the subcomp and add an anchor point animator to the track mat layer. 
set the anchor point X to around minus 15. Because we don't want anything visible at the start, create a keyframe at frame 15, go back to frame 0 and set X back to 0. Looks good in the main comp. Now, let's add a glow. The foolproof approach is using a third-party glow, like deep glow or optical glow. I'm using optical glow here. And don't worry, I'll also show that the native glow effect isn't that bad. Before that, let's tweak revolutions again to add more detail to the fake refractions. But not much is happening. Even animating angle offset from minus 270 to 0 degrees over 75 frames barely changes anything. Here is why. CC Vector Blur relies on a vector blur map. If you don't set one, it uses the layer itself. And when we check the subcomp, the vector map is basically solid white. There is no variation for the blur to work with. So, duplicate the main text layer in the subcomp, set the track map to none, and change its fill color to black. Back in the main comp, the blur pattern now has more contrast, and adjusting revolutions has a stronger visual effect. Play with it. Colorizing the glow helps too. You can even art direct the glow by adjusting revolutions. And yes, you can absolutely use the native glow effect. To tint it, set glow colors to A and B colors and change color A and color B to whatever fits your design. Actually, looks pretty decent. And since we're already playing with colors, stacking a CC toner on top can push it even further. Do you have some ideas to push it further? Try things out and see what happens. And that's it, guys. After Effects developers give us tools built for a clear purpose, but the real fun starts when we push them past that purpose and create things they never planned for, like using the CC Vector Blur effect for glass effects. To me, that's a kind of teamwork between them and us creatives. And I hope it inspires you to think outside the box. See you next time. Oh,